You know what it's like when you're in a store and your family splits up, right? And then you have to try to find where your family members are, right? Um, you know, when, when that happens, something that I've, I've noticed over the years is that if we're split up, I can spot my family from far away, right? Like, if there's a crowd of people, I can still see my family. Yeah, because I think they're, I know them so well, their image is so clear in my mind, if I see them from far away in a crowd of people, I can still identify my family. And even if I don't see them, if I'm in a store like Target or something like that, I have a pretty good idea where some of them are going to be, right? I'm not going to name names, but one family member, I'd go to the toy section, Titus, Another, the clearance section. And another, if it's Target, probably Starbucks. But, but anyway, I know them. I know what they look like. I know what they like. I know, I, can, I know their voices. I can just hear them speaking and know that they're close by. But even then, because my knowledge is incomplete, I have to text and say, well, where, where are you guys at, right? When we understand today, we're going to see that God is a sovereign, all-powerful. We're going to see some of his attributes today, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his, his omniscience, that, that God is all of these things. And because of that, that should affect how we worship and how we live our lives for God. This psalm we're going to see is a psalm of David where David describes his relationship with God. And I think as we look through it, we will see some very important truths. David, just first of all, describes who God is, and then he describes his reaction to the truth of God and, and who he is. So let's turn together in our Bibles to Psalm 139. Um, I had a, a busy week. I was out of town, so um, I did not prepare a slideshow. So you're going to have to look it up in your Bibles, okay? Take out your Bibles. There's Bibles in the pew, maybe. I'm sure you all have them on your phone. But, but uh, take those out this morning and turn with me to Psalm 139. As we've been looking at the psalms, something I, that I, I just love about these, these, these psalms that were intended to be sung as God's people, that we see that all of these songs um, cover so many different areas of our lives. And we've learned so much about God. We've learned that, that, the, to, that we need to walk in his way. We need, we've learned that, that when we, we mess up, that God is there to forgive us and to renew us and to make us whole. We've learned about the power of God's word and the significance of God's word in our life, how it, it gives us everything that we need. And so today, as we continue, let's look at this psalm together, Psalm 139, and let's read verses 1 through 6. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. As this psalm begins, we see David laying out some very significant things about God and who he is. And so for point number one in our outline, I think this psalm teaches us, number one, the Lord knows me. The Lord knows me. David is saying, God, you know me. You know everything about me. You, it describes here in verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. This is describing an intimate, close relationship where God is focused on David. It's not as if that God had just heard about this guy, David. It's, this is saying, God, you have looked into my life. You have searched me. You know everything about me. I know sometimes in life it feels like God is far away. 
It feels like God doesn't see what's going on in our lives. But this psalm reminds us that just as God knew David, God knows us. And when we look at the knowledge that God has, first of all, in verse 2, it it says, you know when, when I sit down and when I rise up. Basically, this is describing the activities of David throughout his day. Right? Throughout our days, we, we get up, we go places, we sit down. You know, basically, David is saying, God, you know everything I do. You know, you know what's going on in my life. You know the things that are concerning me. You know the struggles that I'm facing. You know the, the challenges that are brought before me. Lord, you, you know everything that I'm going through. You know, he uses sit down and rise up, and really that's just a figure of speech to say, and everything in between, right? The knowledge of God covers every area of our lives. And he, he, in the end of verse 2, he says, you discern my thoughts. So God not only knows the actions, the activities of David, he knows the thoughts of David. He knows what David is thinking And with that, he knows the joys, he knows the pains, the hurts, he knows the anger, the discouragement. God knows all of those things. And as we understand and look at this psalm, although David is speaking of himself, I believe this is true for all of us. God has searched us. He knows us. He knows what we're doing in our lives. He knows our thoughts. He knows everything. Back to verse 3. It says, you've searched my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Just that reiteration that God knows everything. Verse 4, before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. David seems to be rephrasing these ideas that God knows my actions. He knows my thoughts. He knows, and here he, he says, even before I speak, you know what I'm going to say. In verse 5, it says, oh, you hem me. This, this verse is really, this is, verse is really important. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. I just see this picture of of parents with their children, right? The idea is God is standing in front of us so that nothing in front of us will hurt us, right? God is standing behind us so that nothing can come from behind. And it says, your hand is on me. Have you ever had that situation as a parent where there's danger and your hand just reaches out to your child? Maybe it's in a car. You know, uh, you, uh, you have to stop short. So you just reach your hand out to touch your child, to, to let them know I've got you. Right? When we were in Florida, before we left, we went on this roller coaster at Universal Studios. And basically, the roller coaster starts by going straight up like this, right? And then it turns and does all that crazy stuff. But, you know, roller coasters a lot of times have those things, uh, harnesses that come over and lock you in. This just had a, uh, uh, one that goes across your waist. And I was beside Anna, and Anna was small. And she was, and I was scared that she would fall out. I had my hand over there trying to, you know, I know I probably couldn't have done anything if anything happened, but, but just to, to, to be there to keep her safe. And this is saying, that's like God for us. Just like a parent would stand in the way of someone trying to hurt their child and put their arm out and protect, to protect and keep their child safe. David is saying, God, this is what you are, this is how you are to me. Not only do you know me, Lord, but you are here for me to protect me, to be there when I'm in trouble. There was a, um, a woman in Colorado back in 2016. She was in her house and she heard her five year old scream. So she ran outside, and there she found a, a, um, a mountain lion on top of her child with the child's head in its mouth. Now, can you imagine what a mom would do in a situation like that? She ran 
to the mountain lion. She pried open the mouth and got her child out and fought a mountain lion to protect her child. It, it says that, uh, that she yanked it away and was able to physically remove the, the mountain, the son, her son from the mountain lion's jaws. And when I think of that story, I just think of the love and devotion a mother has for a child that they will do anything to protect them and keep them safe. And if that's true of mothers and fathers and parents, it's also true of God. God knows us, and because of that knowledge, it's not just some passing knowledge where he isn't concerned about our life. That knowledge leads to activity where God is standing before us with his arm upon us. He's protecting us through all of the things that we face in our lives. And all of us need to understand God knows us. He knows what we're going through. He knows our struggles and he is there with us for everything that we face. We see this in the first section of the verse of this psalm. Now we're going to look at the second section starting in verse 7 and we're going to look at verses 7 through 12. It says, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even darkness is not dark to you, for the night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. In the first section of the Psalms, we talked about how God's knowledge, that God knew David and God knows us, that God's knowledge is perfect. And, and if we think about that in terms of theology, we talk about the attribute of God's omniscience. But this second section talks about God's presence. And point number two is God, the Lord is with me. Not only does God know me, but the Lord is with me. David is saying, where can I go where you are, where you are not? Where can I go from your spirit? It even describes him trying to flee from the presence. You know, I think of, of Jonah in that situation, trying to flee from the presence of God, and we know how that turned out for him, right? David is saying, I can't go anywhere where you are not there. Even if I try to flee, it doesn't matter. You are there with me. And he, he uses some description here to, to describe how God is everywhere. How no, he can't go anywhere where, where God is not. He says, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. And when we think of these terms, I think this is, as we see David's description of, of God's presence everywhere. You know, David here is mentioning places, first of all, he'd never been, right? When we think of heaven, we, we know about heaven, right? We read about heaven. We, we, we understand that heaven is the place where God dwells. But, but it is a mystery to us. It's foreign. It's something we've never experienced. But David is using this to describe the, the, the breath of God's creation. Not only the physical world, but the spiritual world. He's saying, Lord, if I go to heaven, you're there. You know, I think especially in David's day, he didn't understand what outer space was and, and how the universe works. But the idea is, you know, you can, we could go off to outer space. It doesn't matter. God is there. We could go to Sheol in, the ancient, in ancient Israel. Sheol was the place of the dead. Typically, it's described as in the ground or in the earth, right? And, and they understood that once we die, you know, that, that, that there's a place where, where the dead go. And Sheol was, was uh, that place, and, and often it was described also as a place of judgment. David says, Lord, if I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go into Sheol, into the depths of the earth, you're there. 
He he says in verse 9, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. I think what he's describing here is when the dawn rises and and the sun shines forth. Now, especially in Israel, the sun would would rise from the east and, and as David would look at that, the sun rises in the east and shines forth into the west where the sea is. And I think David is saying, you know, David's experience was, was in that one place his, his entire life, right? He didn't travel. He didn't understand about the globe and, and North America and all these places. This was David's world. And he says, Lord, when, when, the, when the morning comes and the light shines forth, if I would, if I would grab a beam of light from the dawn... And it would take me as far as I could go. The farthest David knew was the sea. He says, Lord, you're there. Even if I, if I fly on the wings of the, of, of the morning. Notice in verse 10, even there your hand will lead me. And your right hand shall hold me. We see this idea of the the hand of the Lord upon David's life. In the first section, we see the hand is there for protection. To hem David in so nothing can hurt him. Here we see the hand of the Lord leading David. Guiding David. Holding David. And so the idea here is not only does God know me, But God is with me. God is there to guide me, to hold me, to keep me. There's nowhere that is outside the hand and power of God. He even talks about this idea of darkness. He he says, darkness doesn't matter to you, O God. You know, in darkness, there's much we can't see. There's much we don't understand. In darkness, there's fear. but, But darkness is nothing to God. Darkness doesn't confuse God or scare God. He says the darkness is as light to you. David repeats this over and over again that God is with him. No matter where he goes, he can't outrun God. And his presence is there beside him all the time. Now, you ever watch sporting events and you notice how athletes, you know, like to touch each other, give each other high five, chest bump, all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, and, and sometimes I look at that and I'm like, okay, whatever, you know. But, and I remember when I played sports, I, I wasn't necessarily like that. But they, they actually did a study about NBA players. And they studied the amount of touch that they do for each other other, you know, high fives, hitting each other, whatever, you know. Um, and they showed that the more touches, they called it celebratory touches. The more celebratory touches of pro basketball players, fist pumps, high five, chest bumps, leaping shoulder bumps, chest punches, all of those kind of things, they found that the teams that did that more played better, were better teams. They discovered that, that if there was this idea of, of, of camaraderie, that we're in this together, that, that we're, we're, we're in, this, in this challenge together, that we're going to be there and we're going to celebrate and, and, and the, you, that they are all united in one common purpose, that that touch actually helps. And as I was reading that, I, I thought about you know, the touch of God in our life. That as we walk through darkness, God is there with his hand on us, touching us, showing us that he cares for us. That no matter where we go, God is right there beside us. And he's reaching out. And we are never outside of his grip. This psalm reminds us that the Lord knows us, that the Lord is with us. And the third section begins in verse 13. Let's look at verses 13 through 16 together. He says, For you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. 
I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me. And, yet, and when as yet there was none of them. The first section we see God knows us. Then we see God is with us. And in this third section, point number three, we see the Lord made me. The Lord made me. David is very clear. He is there because God made him. When we think of, of, uh, of a human being, we think of the mother and the father and, had, and how they produce a child. But David is clear, it, it was God who performed this miracle. It was God who knit me together. It was God who arranged his DNA and formed him and shaped him in his mother's womb. Now think about that for a second. David recognizes that he is made by God and that describes a personal relationship that when God makes something, he is involved with it, he cares about it, he, he wants it to fulfill the purpose that he has for it. And he says, Lord, you knit me together. And then David looks and says, Lord, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. When we think about the human body, and what it takes for a human body to function. When we think of all of the cells and how they have to, to reproduce and, and how the DNA is formed and, and how all of that works, it's amazing. But God is the one who made us. God is the one who made us just as we are. David understands that he is who he is because God made him. And that God was involved in that act of creation to bring life into this world. David says in verse 15, My frame was not hidden to you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Now this might sound a little weird to us because we know babies don't come from the depths of the earth, right? But in the ancient world, in Israel, ancient Israel, they did believe there was this mythology that that. Um, babies or, or the souls of human beings came from the earth. That they were formed before, uh, before they were in their mother's womb. And so David is, is describing this. You know, it's kind of funny, they, they, these idea that they come from the earth and they return to the earth, you know, in Sheol. But David is saying, Lord, you, you, my soul, when it was made and, and woven together, it's because of you. And, and as we understand this, I think this is really significant for us because sometimes we really question why God made us the way we are. A lot of times we question things about us that we don't like. We say, Lord, why didn't you make me taller so I could be in the NBA? Well, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that, but... Uh, Lord, Lord, why didn't, you, why didn't you allow me to have this quality? Lord, why did you give me this weakness? Lord, why did, you, why did you make me vulnerable in this area? And we question what God is doing. But these verses tell us God knit us together. God intricately wove us together the way he intended and it tells us here at the end of this section, not only that, but before David was even born, God had a plan for his life down to the, the days that he had on this earth. Before he was even born, God had a plan and a purpose for his life and knew the day he would die and had a purpose for the, those t that time that David had on this earth. The whole purpose of this is to say, Lord, this is all according to your will and your purpose. You made me. You, you made my life and formed my life and brought me into these circumstances and, and has given me a time to live on this earth. But it all, all comes back to God. 
David recognizes that God knows everything. He's omniscient and the Lord knows us. He recognizes the presence of the Lord. The God is omnipresent. The Lord is with us no matter where we go. Then we see just a glimpse of the power of the Lord that the Lord made us. He's omnipotent. He weaves us together. He, he knows our lives and has a purpose for our life. So as we get to the conclusion, we're going to see that David is now going to reflect on what this means for him. If God knows him, if God is with him, if God made him, how then should David live his life? Look at verse 17. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. You know, David is trying to, trying to fathom the greatness and majesty of God and he just can't. He's saying, Lord, I, I, this is too much for me. I can't understand your thoughts. The vastness of your thoughts is so great. I can't count them. I don't understand them. I just know that they are true. I know that you are God. I know that you are over everything. Then look at verse 19. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them as your enemies. As we see David reflect on who God is, I think we see him apply this in his life. And first of all, it, it, it leads David to a devotion and loyalty to God. And I mean, notice what he's saying. He's, Lord, he's saying, Lord, I, slay the wicked. You know, David, David isn't hoping for, for wickedness or putting wickedness in his life. Instead, he's saying, oh, men of blood, depart from me. I don't want to have anything to do with this wickedness. He talks about the enemies of the Lord and he desires that his heart be in line with God's heart, that he hates the things that God hates, that the enemies of God are his enemies. He wants this loyalty and devotion to the Lord to be demonstrated in that he is on God's side. And he wants the things that God wants. A natural response to knowing who God is. To knowing all of the majesty of what he's done. David is saying, Lord, I, 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 want, an, I, want, to, I want to hate the things you hate. I, I want your enemies to be my enemies. I want wickedness and evil to depart from my life. And as we look at this in our lives, I think this is really important. As Christians, we are not devoted or loyal to a church or a denomination. We shouldn't be loyal or devoted to a, to a, a person. You know, we could look at all of the things that, that take our loyalty and our devotion, you know, whether it be political parties or, 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 um, or anything else. We need to, as Christians, desire to be in line with the will of God. That, he, that we desire his will and we are devoted to him. As we look at the psalm, I think David is calling us, and we're going to see in the, in the last part, to look at our lives and to say, Oh Lord, are your enemies my enemies? Oh Lord, do I desire wickedness to depart from my life? Lord, you know everything. You know my thoughts. You know what I do in secret. You know everything. So I can't hide this from you. But I want my heart to be in line with your will. And the last part of the psalm, verse 23 and 24, says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. 
and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What's really interesting as we look at verse 23 is that it mirrors verse 1. Verse 1 says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. That's how the psalm begins. And then at the end, as, as David is, is bringing this to a conclusion, he's saying, search me, O God, and know my heart. He's inviting God to take a look at his life. He's saying, Lord, please search me. Know my thoughts. Try me. He, he's calling on God to evaluate his life and, and to see what David is doing in his life. I think we see not only does, does knowledge of who God is lead to devotion in David's life, it leads to examination in David's life. And a desire for God to make right anything that's wrong. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. He's saying, Lord, if there's something in my life that does not honor you, if there's something in my life that is grievous sin in your sight, reveal it to me. And I think it's also a call for God to cleanse him of those things. David is saying, Lord, make me clean. Make me whole. Help me get rid of these sins and these evil thoughts. And then it says, and lead me in the way. I think these last verses is, is, a, is a sign of David's submission to God in his life. He's saying, Lord, I'm yours. Search me. Get rid of all the garbage. I, I, I need your help. And Lord, lead me. I want to follow you. I want to do your will. I want to do what you've called me to do. And so for us, I think as we look at the psalm, I think the application David gives us is the application we all should have as we understand the power and the majesty of God. We should be devoted to him. We should examine our lives and submit to the will of God in our lives. God is amazing. His knowledge is beyond what we could ever understand. His presence, we, we can't understand how God is everywhere all at the same time, right? I mean, we can't understand how God is present with me throughout my whole life and with you throughout your whole life. That, that we, can, we can send someone to the moon and God is there, right? That, that we can't escape the presence of God. How that works, we have no clue. We, we know that God knows all things, that he is everywhere, that he has made not only us, but this whole universe. And because of that, we are responsible to him. And so this morning, I ask you to consider your devotion to the Lord. Consider whether you are submitting your life to the Lord Consider whether you are willingly following God's lead and instead of trying to make a path your own way. The knowledge of God and who he is should lead us to examine our lives and walk in line with God's will, whatever that may be. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for this morning and for this reminder of who you are. And, and, and this time here to, this morning can't possibly even, even give us a glimpse of your power and majesty and glory. Lord, you are, you're the, you're, you are above us and, and so great that we can't comprehend who you are. But what we know, Lord, I pray, will lead us to follow you, to obey you, to submit to you. Lord, help us to follow Help us to praise you for your works. Help us to recognize you are the king. You are the one we must follow. We pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen.